Thank you for the very kind introduction. Yes, I was uh, the sixth Ombudsman of Ontario appointed in 2005. I was reappointed uh, in 2010. So feel free to call me 007. <laughs> Before I get going here, I want to ask you, uh, there's a beautiful S-Class Mercedes V8 Turbo parked right in front of your building. Who owns that? <laughs> I, just, I just said I'm in the wrong business. Okay? <laughs> So I'm here to talk to you today about what open government means to the Ombudsman and what the Ombudsman means to open government. And thank you for inviting me to um, speak today. I know it's a very festive occasion here on your 35th uh, anniversary. We uh, will be uh, tweeting this presentation live, hashtag OO live. So if you are on Twitter, feel free to contribute to the discussion. As I mentioned, uh, you are celebrating your 35th anniversary, and just in a matter of a few months, we'll be celebrating our 40th anniversary, so we can all celebrate together. I've got my two drink tickets. <laughs> I tend to party harder. Okay? <laughs> so I know a little bit about your history, uh, the longevity and flexibility of your institution, and the Ombudsman of Ontario will not quite as old as your institution, but dates back to 1809, and this is Lars Mannerheim, the first uh, Swedish ombudsman. I know that um, when you say the word ombudsman, it sounds like something you buy at Ikea. <laughs> and it's not too far from the truth because of the uh, principles set out in the constitution of the first Swedish parliamentary ombudsman are very well uh, the same that we apply today, they're found in our statute, as well as other classical ombudsmans across, um, across Canada and the world. And by the way, the word ombudsman is considered to be gender neutral. It means citizen's representative in Swedish. Now, I've been asked to speak specifically about uh, open government this afternoon. And uh, that is the beginning of our discussion. An open government means a lot more than simply uh, distracting buzz about buzz talk about open data and portals and web apps. And it's all of that, but it goes much further than that. Open government is something that we not only need to embrace, but to promote. And our office has been very active in doing that. Backing up to last March, the Premier first announced the various parts of this open government plan. The broader public sector and MPP accountability and transparency act was introduced. As far as our office is concerned, because that act has many components, including capping the salary of the highest paid broader public servant to double the salary of the Premier. But as far as our office is concerned, it extends our mandate to municipalities, universities, and school boards. Huge expansion of the mandate. We currently oversee 500 different bodies, and 549 will be added to them, including all municipal council across the province, and all the universities, 22 of them, school boards, 83 of them. Uh, this represents uh, over $30 billion in uh, provincial government expenditures. <coughs> So this, these are monies provided by the province to the municipalities, which up to this date, strangely enough, uh, have been in the form of a blank check. And so the first Ombudsman of Ontario since 1975 has been advocating uh, that we move into the mush sector, and it took uh, 39 years to get where we are. Yesterday, This is a real-time picture from about 13 hours ago. Uh, yesterday, I appeared before the um, Legislative Assembly Committee uh, to testify on Bill 8 as the last witness to rebut all the special interest groups that are saying it's so bad. The special interest groups being various municipalities, universities, school board, everybody we're going to oversee, <laughs> basically, are uh, predicting apocalyptic style consequences. The world as we know it will not continue to exist after Bill 8. Even the Ontario Auditor General, the Ottawa Auditor General, I don't know what I have to do with them, 
but it's these apocalyptic scenarios, the chaos. I, I kid you not, the word chaos was used. You know, it's oversight. I make recommendations. Boo. <laughs> But this is a sector, the municipalities and university school boards, that basically they've had no, no, uh, no oversight. And oversight doesn't mean I'll be taking over the role of the Toronto Ombudsman. Toronto Ombudsman deals with local issues. I, I hope that the passage of the lake will invite, will, will, will cause more municipalities to uh, create Ombudsman so that we don't have to deal with all the small issues that emerge from municipalities to the others. And certainly, there's been trepidation uh, from uh, the auditor generals that, oh, he'll be redoing audits, and that's our turf. And, you know, that couldn't be further from the truth. As an ombudsman, I'm in Avenue Last Resort examining uh, how decision making is made to make sure the proper check and balance is in place. So we're not there to duplicate, but certainly, you know, through these two days of submissions, uh, everybody will be affected by oversight is opposed to it. And everybody who will benefit from our oversight, citizens, don't think the legislation goes far enough. So that tells me the legislation is a right balance between both interests. Now people say, you know, are you empire building here? Uh, what's going on? In fact, this is the first Ombudsman of Ontario. We published a report in 1979. It was published in the Toronto Star. The Ontario Ombudsman's jurisdiction should be extended to include municipal governments, hospitals, universities, and school boards. So we got them all under Bill 8 except hospitals, where the government's creating a patient ombudsman reporting within the ministry, but that we will be overseeing. So not exactly um, winning the lottery, but pretty close. Now, this gives you a good idea of why we needed Bill 8. Uh, if you look at Ontario and the oversight of the broader public service, pro sorry, broader public service, we have been dead last. And since I've become ombudsman, I have picked up this theme and every year we publish this chart to remind the rest of the world that it's not an apocalyptic scenario, there won't be chaos, all the other provinces are there. And every year as we update this chart, we convert some red X's in other provinces to green checks. The Quebec government has given their ombudsman oversight of hospitals in the last few years. Before that was Alberta. And uh, so every year we update the, the, this chart and turn red X's into green checks. Except, of course, for Ontario area where we're just chugging along with no oversight over the broader public service. And now Bill 8 finally brings us there. I hope it passes. As you can see, the top illustrations, you've got hospitals, universities, uh, municipalities, long-term care, children's aid society, and the police. That's really the broader, broader public sector. And so we're finally uh, getting some oversight there. And we very much look forward to the passage of the late. So what do we do as ombudsmen to promote open government? Well, in terms of the work we do, um, every time I give a speech, it's videotaped, it's uploaded on YouTube, as is the case as I'm speaking right now. We live tweet our, our events just so that people know what we're up to. When it comes to the ombudsman's office, um, we are as transparent as they come. We're a very small group. We're 87 people. To some, that looks small, considering that we handle 27,000 complaints a year. Um, some people see us all over the media all the time. They think, you know, we have an office of thousands of people. So it really depends on your angle. So we try to be, um, to lead by examples, we, um, we disclose proactively our expenses. And in terms of the work we do, we investigate complaints both on an individual basis. So if you call our office, you got a problem getting a birth certificate, you got an upcoming trip, you need to apply for a passport, you call us up and we'll speed up the process. That's an individual case. 
We also work very hard on systemic cases. And I know that uh, to those in power, the systemic cases uh, are uh, a challenge for them to respond to because we raise cases that affect thousands of people. Uh, I would tell you that since 2005, it's likely that uh, no one in this room has not been affected by one of our cases. And if you own property, it's the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. If you have ever bought a lottery ticket, it's a lottery corporation. If you or your family have had children, it's newborn screening. Uh, if you uh, consume electricity, you might be consuming it from Hydro One. The list goes on. And so our work, systemic work, has affected everyone um, in Ontario in one way or another. In the open meetings, open by default report by the government, there is four themes that emerges, that emerge. One is the bureaucracy. The second one is problems with uh, decision making, not involving uh, people, mistrust in government, and finally, the uh, obvious one, uh, undue secrecy. So I propose to go through those four themes and talk about our experience in opening up a government in, in these four um, areas. In the open by default report, it said that people told us their interactions with government can be frustrating. Many people refer to the maze of bureaucracy with its endless corridors and numerous dead ends. How have we seen this in our work? We conducted a systemic investigation to the Criminal uh, Injuries Compensation Board, and we called it adding insult to injury. In that case, we uncovered that it took, well, just back up a little bit, the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board, if you're not familiar with it, was created in 1976. And it states that victims of violent crimes can be, um, I got the French word in my head, can be uh, provide, uh, provided damages by the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board up to $25,000. So there's a hard cap. So if you imagine a victim of violent crime, $25,000 would be the worst victim of violent crime. That amount has not changed since the initial legislation. Might have been proved generous in 76, but certainly in 2000 and almost 15, $25,000 for someone who has been, suffered a violent sexual assault, for example, is not a lot of money. We looked at cases where a father was looking to cover the funeral of his young child who was uh, raped and killed, for example. $25,000 uh, barely covers that. But what was more shocking to us is that the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board took over three years to decide the simplest of cases. They had a system where they, you have to fill out, and I kid you not, up to 56 forms to get the process going. And these forms were reviewed meticulously. So any kind of um, spelling mistake, they'd return you the form. <coughs> We had a, a case where, and this is in our report, I'm not making this up, I swear. In our report, where one of the applicants, and think these are applicants who've, who've just been subjected to a violent, and I mean violent, broken bones, severed limbs, this kind of thing, disfigurement, death, where the applicant is the family. We had a form where someone had, the name of the person had an I in it, so imagine Harding, and the person had not dotted the I, and it was circled in red and returned. Did you not? Then there were other instances where the board would force complainants into hearings to determine, Let, let's hear what you have to say. A hearing was forced in every instance. So imagine a victim of a crime. It's bad enough they have to go to court. It's bad enough they have to be cross-examined. It's bad enough in some cases the accused walks, 
on a technicality or because of reasonable doubt or whatever. But now they have to retestify in front of this administrative board who would decide whether they got any money when there was a court transcript. Sometimes the board had to wait whether there was a conviction. Well, a conviction and being a victim of a crime are two different things. A conviction could be based on identity, reasonable doubt, alibi, whatever, but it doesn't mean you got an injury, you've got an injury. And so we looked at this case, and of course we recommended that there be some pretty big changes. Another point is that the way the Criminal Interest Compensation Board is funded is through a victim surcharge. You might have heard this controversy out there about the minimum victim surcharge. Some judges think it's unconstitutional or not. That's what I'm talking about here. And so if you commit a theft and you're fined, there's like a tax on top of it called the victim surcharge. That money goes into a bank account to then compensate, that's the word I was looking for, compensate violence of victim, victims of violent crime. Except what the government was doing is that it was storing that cash in the consolidated revenue. So in the general bank account of the government, not funneling it to the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board, it was being starved for cash that was supposed to be destined to victims of crime. So the board, not having the cash to do settlements, would grind the whole process to a halt through useless forms, useless hearings, and on and on and on. So we recommended that the government free up the cash collected through the victim surcharge and funnel it where it belongs, where it's supposed to go. And so a virtual immediate implementation uh, was given to our report with $20 million appearing suddenly in the bank account of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. Decision making, people want to have meaningful input with their government, they want to know how their input was considered and how and why decisions are made. You know, we live right now in the internet age where you get all types of information, like it really is incredible. When I went to law school and uh, I graduated my first law degree in 1988, got my second one in 1989, that doesn't seem like very long ago, but there were no computers around. There was there was like one computer every 500 students. It was usually the uh, son of a of rich parent or something like that. Computers were not prevalent, let alone the internet, which really didn't come on board till 94. Now people Google everything, access information is granted. But I can certainly remember the old days. So people want to be involved in the decision making. Let me talk to you briefly about four cases where we came to the conclusion that there was a lack of participation by the public in the decision making which affected the public. One of the cases is called a linspin where the government, government's uh, lens, the local health integrated networks, it's a mouthful, these are the 14 or so bodies across Ontario, which receive money from Queen's Park to then allocate to the region according to priorities. So while they're creating a hospital, not creating a hospital, improving this, improving that, consolidating operations. And in the old days, these decisions were made by Queen's Park and they were implemented in the regions. Over the last the decade, these lens were created the LINs get the money and they run it like a board of directors, allocating it within the region. And there was an issue uh, in one of the LINs we looked at in Hamilton, Niagara. According to the law, the LINs must consult with their communities. That's the whole point, right? If they're not going to consult, might as well keep the money in Queen's Park and have some faceless bureaucrat decide how it's spent. But the LINs are set up so that the board consults with the local population and then makes a decision. And every land was kind of consulting in their own way. And we, we investigated a very controversial decision made by Lynn involving hospital restructuring. We interviewed the Lynn people who made that decision. We asked, well, how did you consult? 
people in your region. And one of them said, oh well, I speak to people at my golf club. Okay, well, I don't belong to a golf club. Um, John Tory does, obviously, because he was telling women to get involved in the golf clubs. Don't tweet that. <laughs> His honor deserves our respect. But you remember reading that, right? Like golf clubs are a pretty elite uh, kind of institution. But you know, so if you're uh, diseased uh, and uh, you don't attend, you don't play golf, or you don't have the money to belong to the golf club, well, you won't be consulted. So there was a problem there. So we recommended uh, some uh, criteria for consulting so that if you happen not to be a member of a golf club, you can still get consulted. Uh, drug funding, we looked into a case that we called a vast injustice about the funding of a vast thing. See the play on words? <laughs> your librarians are clever, you know? <laughs> Um, Avastin is a first line of defense for colorectal cancer. Anyone here heard about Avastin? Yes, there are a couple of uses for Avastin that uh, it's one of those uh, miracle drugs that we haven't really decided what exactly it can fight on top of colorectal cancer. With colorectal cancer, we know that Avastin uh, treats it. Now in Ontario we have a Hard cap for Boston. So, despite the fact it was effective, proven, first line of defense, you only got 16 treatments, and that's it. Goodbye, good luck, see you later. Hopefully, you'll survive. Other provinces have what we call a soft cap. So, soft cap is you get a first round of 15 or so, and there's still it's still stopping disease progression. It's working. So let's continue another three, four. Is it still working? Shrinking tumors? Yes. Let's continue until it's gone. Ontario, 16, you're out of luck. So we actually found some cases where people's cancer tumors were shrinking, and then they were cut off of Austin, and then the tumors grew, grew back. And so we recommended to the Ontario government that they have a soft cap where they evaluate disease progression makes sense. So we recommended uh, that it be based not on a rigid rules base, but on an assessment on each individual's reaction to the drug. Oversight undermined was our investigation into the uh, Ministry of the Attorney General and the Special Investigations Unit, which is the body that investigates police shootings and deaths and uh, serious injury caused by the police. And we discovered in that case, in the following one that we called Oversight, sorry, that is the one, Oversight Undermine, it was preceded by another case called Oversight Unseen. In Oversight Undermine, which was our second investigation into the SIU, we discovered that the SIU was a lot more uh, cognizant of their public duty of diligence and doing their job properly and not seeing cases through blue colored glasses. But the problem was that the Ministry of the Attorney General was censoring their annual reports so that it would quell controversy over police oversight. Now we're talking about open government when an arm's length agency of the government is not able to release its annual reports as being censured. It runs completely against any notion of open government. I kept careless about child care as the last one. This is a case that we looked at following the deaths of four young children in the greater GTA area in seven months. And it is about how the government was failing at inspecting child cares in Ontario. The basic rule is, if you have a, if you operate a child care with, uh, I believe it's six or less children, include, not including your own, that's the old rule, you're allowed to operate it as an unregulated daycare. So we see them all the time, the mom and pop operations that, you know, keep four or five kids kind of thing. <coughs> 
and uh, they are unregulated, but that doesn't mean they're not, should not be inspected. And what was happening in Terra was that uh, many of the, several, many, some, uh, were operating illegally as an unregulated daycare. Uh, the case we looked at closely, the case of the young Eva, she was four years old, on the books as a unregulated daycare and she died, and closer inspection by our office revealed that there were 29 children and 14 dogs in that daycare. And then the government had been tipped off several times, and then inspectors had never uh, actually inspected this daycare. Now you have to remember, these daycares were like on suburban streets, right? So neighbors, you know, wake up one morning and there's 29 cars for the 29 babies. So what do they do? They're like, they call the cops. The cops say, well, it's not our business, call the entire government. You know, neighbors uh, call in their other neighbors because suddenly there's a huge traffic jam on the street. This couldn't be only five kids. Now, the government's inspection of daycare, again, I kid you not, one inspector per 22,000 spots in daycares. Now, when I, daycares become a little bit of a lightning rod because um, there, there have been some claims that as a result of our report, we tabled our report and made 113 recommendations. That was only a few weeks ago. The government introduced a bill the same day to uh, change the rules. The bill not only implements our recommendations, but admittedly goes beyond, goes further. And uh, there are many uh, daycare operators that are very upset and some are claiming that it will, uh, it will lead to hundreds of thousands of spots being canceled, people just saying it's not worth it, moving on. But certainly it's an area that was primed for reform. And the, argue, the argument that some of the detractors are saying is that why should the government be involved in inspecting daycares? Well, that's the responsibility of the parents. But you know, to, you, you, you get the scenario. You've got two working parents, everyone's in a rush. You visited the daycare one day. You know, things may have been all looking pristine because they were recruiting that day. So you develop a trust and then you say, you know, the system will work. You know, it's a, the government keeps an eye on these things. And everybody, the, the couple both works, you know, eight, 10 hours a day. You rush in the morning, you're rushing at night. You don't walk in every day, you're gonna inspect the whole place. You know, you don't know how these things are run. You know, of course, the case of Eva was an extreme one, but you know, there are others that are having 10, 12 kids, and you know, the home's large, and kids are scattered. And so you know, certainly the government has a duty here to make sure that the rules are followed. Mistrust in open, uh, the open uh, report. Participants noted feelings of mistrust towards political parties. They felt that information provided by politicians and government is not candid, responsive, or easy to find. Let me tell you about, see what I've done? I think you're gonna to wanna to move out of Ontario, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna say, Quebec, here I come. Uh, Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, that was another horror story. Um, the um, Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, we investigated as a result of uh, complaints of unfair assessments, uh, faulty assessments, lack of disclosure, being sandbagged at hearings, um, not being transparent about how they value your home. For those who are not familiar with MPAC, it is the provincial body which decides how much your, your home is worth. And depending on how much your home is worth, will dictate how much municipal taxes you pay. So people who own big expensive homes tend to play down the value of their homes outside cocktail parties because they'll be paying more taxes. And so the, we had hundreds of thousands of complaints. I mean, when we started the MPAC investigation, we had 75 complaints. Within three weeks, we had 4,000. And uh, the complaints were, you know, citizen challenges the state's assessment of the value of their home arrives at the Assessment Review Board, which is the quasi-judicial tribunal, 
set up to arbitrate disputes between the government and homeowners. And as they enter this court setting at the door, MPAC representative would say, oh, yeah, so you're challenging this. This is additional information that you should know. Big was of binders, and, you know, citizens are like, I didn't know what to do. You know, these are simple citizens challenging the system. And the old rule put the onus on the homeowner to disprove the value of the home. So we, so that's why we came to the conclusion, these were cutthroat tactics, secretive, uh, they didn't provide enough variables, how much is this house worth? Oh, well, we can't, we can't tell you, you'll find out when we get to court. So this kind of uh, approach, so what we managed to do is we made several recommendations that led to the government freezing property assessments for two years, where they reintroduced legislation. And that legislation had a whole bunch, a myriad of tweaks and important measures, but the most important one of them all was to put the onus of proving the value of your home not on you, but on the government. Because the government has all the information. But the government is the one that, you know, when you register your home, you transfer the property's title, whatever, the government knows everything about your home. You just know what is in your home and what the neighbor told you about their home. But you, don't, you can't pry into that information. So we're able to displace, dislodge the burden of proof from the citizen to the state where it should belong. Why was it on the citizen and not the state? It's because traditionally in income tax matters, the onus is on you. And it's on you to prove your income because you're the only one who knows how much income you have, not the government. You may be working under the table, taking stuff for cash, you may be have multiple jobs where T4s get lost. So the government is not, doesn't know how much you make. It can challenge you and then the defaults on you. In terms of property, there was no reason why the, the, er, the onus of evidence was on the citizen and not the state because they held all the information. So again, opening up a disclosure of information from MPAC to the citizen about how they've arrived the value of your home shifting the onus back where it should have been in the first place to the government, all level the playing field. Right now, we get very few complaints about impact. Nobody likes to pay property taxes. I'm the first one. Uh, but like that, it's one of the sure things in life. But at least if it's done fairly, transparently, with the odds the way they should be, people tend to be able to stomach it more. I talked briefly before about our lottery case. Let's do a time check here. I don't want to cut it to your party time. 4.37, we're right on track. Uh, the lottery case involved um, complaints that retailers were winning disproportionately over average citizens. And at the time we did our investigation, the CBC had retained a statistician who came out on TV and said, um, this is outrageous, what's going on? You know, retailers are winning like in such disproportionate numbers, it's impossible that they're that lucky. There's something must be going on in the system. The Lotteries Corporation took the other position and said, oh, no, we have our own statistician. And he says, everything's cool. <laughs> All right. So what do we do? Well, we go out and hire our own statistician. Let's have a nice little statistician slugfest. Um, what we discovered was that Again, connecting it back to the theme of open government and um, mistrust, that the government didn't even know how many retailers it had. So in order to be able to come out with a reliable statistic, you need to know how many tickets you have, how many retailers you have, what are their wins. None of these things are being tracked. None. Um, the government was even refusing at first to even 
do background checks on the retailers. So you could basically have a retailer who had a criminal record for fraud and theft. So we, we completed the report and we made uh, many recommendations that um, first of all led to the firing of the uh, OLG CEO the same day that we released our report. The whole board was also fired by the government. And uh, a year later, the OLG wrote to us and said, the shock of the Ombudsman's report brought about deep and systemic change within the corporation. It is unlikely that this could have been achieved through more conventional or traditional means of organizational reform. This is the kind of systemic work that is crucial to our office. And some of the Auditor Generals who testified yesterday at BLA don't seem to understand the value of systemic work. Auditor Generals do great systemic work in covering financial scandals. But if it were not for the systemic work that the Ombudsman would do, we wouldn't be able to bring that kind of change to big, complicated organizations that have cultural issues. And the Game of Trust is a perfect example of that. And finally, secrecy. Many people were concerned about the level of secrecy within government. They too feel, they feel too many decisions are made behind closed doors. Of course, we all want to forget about it, but let's talk about it for a moment and remember <coughs> caught in the act, which was our investigation into the G20. I don't know if you're around during the G20, last weekend of June 2010, but there were thousands of people illegally arrested and detained on the basis of a rule which, rule of law which was adopted in secret by the Ontario government at the request of the Toronto Police to give them the right to arbitrarily detain and arrest citizens during the G20 weekend. The only problem with that rule was that it was unconstitutional. It was passed under a law from World War II called the Public Works Protection Act. And since 1939, when it was passed, right to 2014, something happened in 1982. <laughs> it's called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that specifically says no citizen shall be arbitrarily detained and arrested. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> so we passed in secret, we being the Ontario cabinet, not myself, but the Ontario government passed in secret unconstitutional legislation. And people said, you know, so you had on a weekend various civil liberty groups spearheaded by civil liberties lawyers, try to brief protesters. Okay, okay, you want to protest without getting arrested? Here are the rules of the game. A, B, C, D. Except the lawyers briefing their clients who have the legal right to protest were not even aware of this new rule. Now, why would you think the government would keep secret a rule that allowed the Toronto Police to arbitrarily and illegally arrest and detain thousands of citizens? just because it was unconstitutional. If the citizens knew, they could have challenged it in court and got it struck down before that weekend. We recommended that the Public Works Protection Act be abolished. There's currently a bill before the legislature to do just that. And we're hoping that it passes before the Pan Am Games in June 2015, where again, there's a powder keg brewing which hopefully will not lead to the same fiasco of the G20. We currently have a very narrow role in investigating uh, allegations that city council have met uh, privately, secretly, and contrary to the law. And city council have this habit. I kid you, it's kind of a weird thing. They all go out to eat. And when they're eating, they, 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 they agree on, on business of the city. They actually do business in secret while they're eating. It's, it's kind of strange. And I can't see uh, you know, burgers and fries being brought into Queen's Park and locking the doors where everybody 
east, but they do that in municipalities in Ontario. And this is the case of London, where they had this habit of, uh, up until very recently, hopefully that's changed, of meeting just before their budget would pass publicly, and as they pass the fries and the root beer and whatever, they're making crucial financial decisions which are then just rubber stamped publicly. It's kind of a bizarre way to run a government, isn't it? And I kid you not, we have an investigation called In the Back Room, it's on our website, about uh, city council members on a Saturday morning at a pub called Billy T's Tap and Grill. It's a pretty classy place, I'm told. <laughs> and they're in the back room eating burgers and fries on a Saturday, a week before budget time. So, although we've provided a, uh, this illustration, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, it actually depicts uh, the scene in London's Billy T's Tap Tap and Grill. Now, you know, so our job is to investigate allegations by citizens and their council met in secret. And this is another case we did Leeds and the Thousand Islands, when we investigated this case, we didn't meet in secret. So we were told you met in this room. There was no public, there was no notice. You know what the response was? You kept the door open. <laughs> they kept the door open. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of breaking this mold of secrecy and getting municipal government to um, open up. Open government doesn't necessarily make government more transparent or accountable. Shining a light on the misdeeds of institutions isn't as imperative as redesigning how they work. You know, a good example is the work that's being done right now in, um, in hospitals where you have a website that you go to that tells you the, the wait times and all this information. It's a deluge of information, but there's really no one to oversee it. How do you sort all that out? Open doesn't mean um, this data dump. I mean, how many times does, go does government uh, release bad news on a Friday at 4 p.m.? Uh, and then they say, well, it's out there. You know, we're investigating the G20. We said, well, you know, you guys published maps of Toronto, which streets would be closed, which streets should be open when the subways would open, when they would close, all this information was out there, but you never spoke about this new arbitrary rule that you were bringing into place. Why didn't you do that? Oh, as a matter of fact, we published it in the Canada Gazette, page 500, we got a one inch by one inch ad. Well, who reads the Canada Gazette part three? Anybody here read that? Oh yeah, it's our first one. What am I thinking? Of course you would know that. That backfired, huh? <laughs> That's where laws are, are published, uh, Linda. But anyways, yeah, can I get part three? Yeah, jeez. <laughs> All to say, you understand, you read them, but I don't think, I, you know, Joe Blow on the screen reads can I get part three. But they had a little advertisement there that met the strict, you know, narrow, legal definition for publishing something. But they certainly, having put ads in all the papers and radio spots and TV spots of the, what to do not to get into trouble, they never advertised uh, that this new regulation was adopted. So I guess this is the commonality between our office and you. You help people uh, go through the Canada Gazette Part 3, you help people navigate uh, this massive information, this morass of information. And we like to think that we do the same thing, where uh, we act as the GPS for people who want information on the government, what works or doesn't work. And uh, this is our little uh, mascot, Bill 8. This is Bill 8. <laughs> Bill 8 to the rescue. I'm very honored to be the Ombudsman of Ontario. We've uh, really developed a systemic approach to investigations. We've exported it to the world. This is where we talk
to different ovens around the world, from the ovens of Thailand to Bangkok to Namibia, Morocco, South Africa, through the US. We've delivered a course called Sharpening Your Teeth, a course for watchdogs. <laughs> and our job is to raise the bar on systemic investigations, to demonstrate our value, and we've been quite successful at that. As I've indicated, we have a very um, important uh, footprint in social media because uh, you fish where the fish are. Uh, that's where people are gravitating. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and our e-newsletter. If you're interested, go to our website, subscribe. Comes out once a month. All the latest horror stories um, to keep you up at night. So, and if you if you're on Twitter, please uh, please do follow us. So I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, would anyone who has a question, just raise your hand, and Robert and I will make our way over to you with the mic. Various things happen, people got fired, or a bill was introduced, or uh, things happen immediately when your reports have been released. What the, who knows about the information in the report before you release it so that those things can happen on the same day? Good question. We provide the government a draft of our report to allow them to comment back. Fact check, in other words, or you got your facts wrong, uh, to help us. Um, finesse a recommendation or to outright tell us we don't agree with your report, which has not happened in nine and a half years. So we provide a draft, a confidential draft, and that allows the government to get a heads up for their ducks in a row. So it helps us do our work, helps them not be caught by surprise. And the one thing I don't like is in this kind of job, the scenario that we don't like in this line of work that I do is uh, you release a report, it's captivating, it's interesting, but you, you don't want the government to say, oh, well, I just landed it on my desk, so I'll have to read it. By the time they read it, you know, the storm's gone, there's the momentum's gone, so you get in that letter three months later. So that's not what we want. We want the commitments on the spot, we want to see where we're going, and it's because of that, because of our draft reports, that we're able to get things moving. I'm just wondering, do you uh, get complaints from people who are responding to fraudulent uh, emails that they're getting, some from banks that they don't even uh, deal with, but other, other uh, misrepresentations of things that require them to give their account numbers? And often I think that this is directed to uh, elderly people who are not familiar with the internet that much. Do you find people coming to you with uh, this kind of thing? We do, but we don't do those cases because they're not Ontario government. We only investigate Ontario government. I've got a question, uh, Mr. Mayor. Do you have any plans to look at uh, anything dealing with data privacy in the future? Uh, well, we have a uh, information privacy commission in Ontario, so that is really the function of that office. Um, so when I talk about open government, it's from the ombudsman perspective, but there is a dedicated office in Ontario, specialist office to deal with those issues. Would you have planned for the future to investigate? Is there anything in mind or hopeful? Yeah, we, we, have, right, we have right now a, a Hydro One investigation. Um, I'm not sure if, if you're aware of it, but that's ongoing. Um, and it captures all the things we talked about today. It's about unintelligible billings, being overbilled, incomprehensible policies. Those are all the complaints we're investigating. Hits, mistrust. It hits on all the themes. And it's not in my presentation today because we're, it's an ongoing investigation. We started it about a year and a half ago where we noticed that there was a blip in complaint. They went up from 200 to 647. So that kind of caught our eye. We announced the investigation and uh, it's ongoing. Now we're working on close to 9,500 complaints. So we announced it from 
200 to 647, now we got almost 9,500. And we're approaching the issue from two levels. One is the individual level, which is sorting out people calling us saying, I got eight bills in a day. Or I, I own property that burned down five years ago, I'm still getting hydro bills. Kid you not, these are real stories. So we're helping these individuals sort out their individual problem with Hydro One. But we're also doing a systemic investigation as to how do we get there? What is going on in Hydro One? And how do we get out of it and make sure it doesn't happen again in the future? So look for that uh, early, uh, early next year. There's one more question. Two, one, two, three. <laughs> I was just going to ask about privatization issues. Are you investigating anything about LCBO, beer store, those kinds of things? Um, the LCBO falls within our jurisdiction. I don't often tell people that <laughs> this time of year. <laughs> but we oversee the LCBO to begin with. We don't oversee the beer store, which is considered private. Uh, we don't get a lot of complaints about the LCBO, probably because people don't know we oversee it. A couple of secret spots, I never talk about things we oversee, like LCBO and the GO train. You know? uh, we don't want to be paralyzed completely. Um, privatization would not be, we're, we're, we're a complaint driven organization. And um, so, you know, people are not complaining by the hundreds of thousands about privatization. Uh, and it does, it's not an issue that affects people on a day-to-day -day basis, it's more like a broader public government issue. So we do elect our representatives to make those broad public service, broad public policy decisions. So, it, you know, the Ombudsman is uh, the, um, I was talking yesterday to the uh, Legislative Committee, and we're the barometer, we have government barometer issues where the, the, the Oil can, we help putting oils on cars to make sure things turn right. We're the safety valve, we're the horse fly riding on the horse, being the government, nudging it in different ways. So, all the cases we've been doing uh, involve our role as that, but we can't, re we can't replace or supplant the role of government. So, an issue like privatization is one of those issues. Like, I, for one, believe that our liquor laws in Ontario are the most regressive, backwards, you know, anyone who travels around the world, let alone across the border to get back, we'll see how crazy our liquor laws are, but is it an ombudsman kind of thing? I tweet about it, I talk about it, but if I launch an investigation about it, it's just not the same, it's not an ombudsman type issue, just like privatization is not either. When the Ombudsman Office releases a report, what steps do you take to ensure that uh, you optimize the moral suasion that uh, you can apply to the government? And do, are there any additional, is there any additional pressure that you can bring to bear, any kind of sanctions? Yeah, excellent question. No, there's no sanctions. It's all about moral suasion and advocacy once we uh, deliver a report. But, you know, I have speak engagements and I was talking to my staff, they keep growing. Like every week this week is, I think, my third speech this week. Uh, you know, good size audience, good exposure, and that's, you know, when I can't make the speech, my senior counsel, or deputy ombudsman, uh, do it on my behalf. So we do lots and lots of networking, which is part of our um, outreach, which is part of our job, because you're part of my constituency. And so when I issue a report now next week or the week after, they'll say, oh yeah, I saw this guy. Let's read the report. So we do a lot of that. We do a lot of, uh, uh, Media work, speaking to the, the mass media, social media. We have almost 28,000 followers. Not Justin Bieber, but not bad for a beer crack, <laughs> you know? So we do a lot of that. I do a lot of, as well, uh, backroom meetings with ministers. I meet the premier on a quarterly basis on a one-on-one. -on -one. You know, moral suasion is like a huge chain. There's no one thing. It means building good rapport with government, it means, uh, it means uh, having persuasive reports written in colorful language. It means having facts which are unassailable. If I get my facts wrong in my report, I mean, it takes years to build credibility and poof, it could be done overnight. It means re being reasonable in my recommendations, being reasonable with government. Uh, knowing when to pull the plug, knowing when to 
uh, vilify the system, knowing when to praise it, when it works well. Now, I've always said, my kind of job, you only need an average IQ, thank goodness for that. But you need to have a high EQ. You gotta know how to maneuver, you gotta have got a good sense of the land, personalities, power, people. That's key to the job of ombudsman. Um, what happens to complaints you get? How do you manage them internally and how many individual complaints does it take to start a systemic investigation? Yeah, uh, it depends on the case. Um, under our legislation, we have own motion power, which is the power for me to launch an investigation without any complaints. I've done that once in my entire nine and a half years as ombudsman, and that was the lottery case. Because I happened to be watching, was um, it CDC Marketplace? Was it? Fifth Estate. I was watching CDC Fifth Estate. I never watched TV. It's probably in, Unfortunately for the OLG, I was watching TV. <laughs> I remember uh, emailing my staff saying, I want to meet tomorrow morning at 8.30. We're going in the lottery system. Um, so it depends. Again, it's a very subjective thing. Uh, of course, for Hydro One, the nature of the complaints is very much an ombudsman kind of issue. Lack of customer support, unintelligible bills, uh, inefficient practices, uh, inaccurate uh, assessments. So when I saw 200 to 647, I said, wow, that's significant. When I launched my investigation into um, MPAC, I said, I had 75 complaints. MPAC said, oh, there's 1.4 trillion or whatever dollars in property in Ontario, millions of homeowners. You're launching an investigation over 75 complaints. And within three weeks, we had 4,000. <laughs> so it's a judgment call that. You know, unfortunately, we can't just input it in the computer. It depends on um, the public interest and whether we can visualize a solution to the problems we begin it. The public discourse, both in the media, in Parliament, the water cooler. This is actually very. Uh, I present on this for about three hours, with sharpening their teeth. We go through all the criteria with example. Because it's uh, it's something that can't just be easy. It's not tangible, easily defined. It depends on a whole bunch of criteria and judgment, EQ, number of complaints. So there's no set number. Sometimes you get people that a very large group, for example, that are all interconnected. So you might get a thousand complaints, but it's like basically all photocopied, you know. So that doesn't cause me to launch a systemic investigation. How many investigations can you handle at one time? Where did that question come from? Oh, there you are. Uh, again, it depends. Some of the cases are very uh, cut and dry. You know, when I became Hamsman in 2005, we launched an investigation into uh, the treatment of special needs children in Ontario, and we wrapped it up within 25 days, beginning to end. But as we develop this expertise into systemic investigations, we tend to take more complicated ones and take longer. Um, and then people say, well, you know, you're supposed to wrap this one up fast, but who knew that our 647 Hydro One cases were turning into 9,500? So uh, it's a judgment call on our behalf. We wrap one up. We just wrapped up the uh, daycare case. And uh, right now we are uh, awaiting the passage of Bill 8, which will double our jurisdiction. And so we have to be uh, careful not to take too much on. And we always, as an office, have to meet a very high public expectation to be quick and precise and so on. So if anything, right now, we're just following the late to see what's, what's coming down uh, in the next uh, few weeks. You're obviously um, thinking about how you're going to ramp up or what resources you need to do to delay passes. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that, and also um, I had a separate question. I was wondering if you consider yourself to have any responsibility as a representative of the general public service, so people in the system that may be dealing with difficulties because of the system. We, we're currently now number crunching. Uh, we're having our accountant in our office, our uh, director of corporate services, who's trying to project, speaking to our colleagues in other provinces that do cover the much sector. So it's a discussion we're going to have to have with the government. 
uh, because it will require, uh, obviously, um, some tangible new resources. The second part of your question is what? How do we relate to public servants? Do you consider yourself responsible for them in the way that you represent general citizens? Do you also feel like you have some representation for the broader public sector in lower level positions that are in situations that may be unfair to them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm everybody's ombudsman. I get sometimes public officials that come in and say, we have a confidential discussion. It's like, sure, yeah, the, the legislation says everything happens in confidence, including anything you want to tell me. So yes, we do that. Uh, yesterday, uh, the uh, union representing hospital workers uh, testified before Bill 8, saying that they are disappointed with the proposed patient ombudsman within the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. They wanted it to go to the attorney ombudsman. So this is a good example of lying broader public sector workers who are disappointed with Bill 8. So uh, to answer your question, yes. Uh, in the course of your investigation, what powers do you have to compel people to speak with you or provide any sort of information or evidence that you're asking for? Exactly. Excellent question again. Um, right now, we have formal powers, which include the power to compel a witness to testify under oath, power of entry in any provincial government facility or building. We have the ability to, um, in essence, um, come in and just grab a computer hard drive and just copy it and off you go. So we have very, very robust investigative powers. Bill 8 actually goes beyond that. It gives us the ability to have search warrants in private dwellings. Again, directly by our office without judicial applications. So we have very robust investigative powers, which are uh, largely successful. We don't use them hardly uh, because people know we have them. So as long as we have them, you, you uh, use the carrot instead of the stick. But once in a while, you have to remind them, like, you know, we can do this the gentle way, or I can send you a subpoena with, you know, bus money, and they'll see you at my office. Um, and we've done that. Um, but we don't have to do that. Uh, as well, any obstruction, impediment to the ombudsman's work is punishable by fine or jail. That helps too. So we have very good cooperation. No one's ever been prosecuted. From time to time, we have to remind people, not people that are in the print and terror government, but with our new line of work overseeing these secret meetings in municipalities, you know, you gotta a municipal councillor in, in Sudbury who's never heard of our office, and we walk in like, who, who are you? You know, I've been elected. You're from Bay Street in Toronto? You know, so they, there's a kind of a, a lack of education about our office. Because we have a 40-year history with the entire government, it's not an issue, right? We launched an investigation, and the, um, you know, we might have a hold up at the uh, lower levels of, management, for example, in the bureaucracy, you just say, put your boss on the line, and you know, if he doesn't understand, put your boss on the line, eventually we'll hit somebody who's heard about our office, and suddenly things work. So we try to be patient with people and not just uh, arrive there and um, with, with the stick. We try to be patient, explain to them, this cooperation is really not an issue in my job because of the tools we have. So because of those tools, I don't have to use them. If I didn't have them, that would be a problem. Well, I think we've taken you past the, uh, the appointed time, Mr. Mayor, and thank you so much for that uh, very informative and, and interesting uh, talk you've given us. Thank you very much for all the questions.